Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ our Lord and welcome to worship. You look awfully festive today. <laughs> We're celebrating Christmas in July today, so thank you for, uh, for your presence here and for the joy that you bring uh, to this space. It is always a good and uh, joy-filled thing to be together in God's house with our church family. Now, Christmas in July isn't an official holiday, um, but we are Christmas people, and we are Easter people, and we are people who worship the child who was laid in the manger and the Lord who left the empty tomb. Uh, so today uh, we're concluding our uh, gospel and film series, and uh, we're talking about a Christmas film uh, in our service today. Um, also, thank you for bringing uh, the Operation Christmas Child boxes uh, with you today. Uh, we'll have a prayer for those in our service, and then after worship, um, I think there's some cookies and punch laid out in the fellowship hall, and we'll make some uh, Christmas cards, some notes of care and love and joy to tuck into those boxes as we prepare to send them um, out into the world to bless children. Uh, you'll find in your bulletin some other opportunities for, uh, for service and for discipleship here at Francis Asbury. Uh, coming up this week on Tuesday night, uh, ladies, we're having uh, Zumba and Bible study. I hope that you will come to join us. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, choir practice is continuing. Uh, they're working on the Christmas cantata already, and we're going to get a little preview um, today of that choir cantata. So maybe the Spirit will nudge you. Um, there's some seats still available. You can still uh, join the choir and participate in that uh, Christmas cantata uh, for this year. On Saturday, uh, the United Methodist men are having their annual Low Country Shrimp Boil. Um, all of those proceeds will benefit and support Hominy Valley ABCCM. So uh, if you want to come and volunteer your time, Help, um, help them prepare it. That will gather here at noon uh, to get it ready. The sale starts at 4. And so invite your friends and neighbors to come. Nobody wants to cook dinner Saturday night, so pick it up and support a wonderful cause um, while you're at it. Um, next Sunday, uh, we'll celebrate Holy Communion here um, as part of our worship. And then after worship, we're going to have an information session for those who have said they'll be a volunteer um, in our children's church ministry. So if that's you, uh, you should have gotten a message about that. They'll plan to stay after worship. Um, and we'll have a little just information session helping you feel ready and equipped um, to serve in that capacity. You'll see some other notes here about signing up for, um, for a baseball game, for lay uh, readers, uh, women's group that is starting. Um, and we're going to be collecting um, back-to-school supplies because August starts this week and it's time to start thinking about um, some of those, those back-to-school items. So. Um, let you read those and pick up an August newsletter and find uh, some ways to engage here in the life of our church. Will you join me in our call to worship? Glory to God in the highest. And hope to every discouraged heart. Glory to God in the highest. And peace to every conflicted soul. Glory to God in the highest. And joy to every outcast spirit. Glory to God in the highest, and love to everyone. Let, Let us sing praises to our God. Please stand as you're able and join us again. Mark the Herald Angel Sing.
everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones, and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace, and a time to refrain, refrain from embracing. Excuse me. A time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away. A time to cheer, and a time and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to every work to be busy with. He will make everything suitable for its time. Moreover, He has put a sense of past and future into the minds yet they cannot find out what has done from the beginning to the end. Jesus said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. We remember those words of Jesus and invite all of our young disciples uh, to come forward uh, for a time of sharing.
Sam hung up his coat. It was good to be home. As he sat at the kitchen table to have a snack, he noticed a sparkle box gleaming on the mantel. Mom, did you put anything in the sparkle box? Well, actually, I did put something in it today, she said, but it's still not ready to be opened. We need to add a couple more things to it. Sam wondered what was inside. The days flew by, and soon it was time for one of Sam's favorite events, the Christmas party at his dad's office. There was always lots of food and a present for every kid at the party. Sam's dad thanked everybody for coming. He talked about how blessed they were and how people in the world struggled for something as simple as clean water to drink. He said a village in Africa would receive a special gift this year thanks to money that the employees donated. The gift was a well that would provide clean water for an entire village. Sam asked his mom if their family helped. Yes, dear, we did. He looked around. The grown-ups were smiling, but he saw tears, too. Happy tears, his mom whispered. As his dad tucked him into bed that night, Sam thought about his Christmas list, and that reminded him of another present. Hey, Daddy, did you and Mom fill up this sparkle box yet? Sam asked. Well, we added something to it tonight, but it's not ready to be opened. Sam drifted off to sleep, imagining what could be inside. A few days later, Sam was filled with excitement as he shopped with his mom. Tomorrow was his school party. There was a Christmas tree called a mitten tree where the kids could hang mittens and scarves for people who needed them. Sam picked out the biggest pair of mittens he could find. He also bought a candy bar for himself with his own money. When he turned to leave, Sam heard the tinkling of bells. He looked up and he saw the man from the park bench coming in the door. The man seemed tired. Sam looked at the candy bar in his hand, and he thought about the mittens in his bag, and he looked at the man's hands. They looked cold. Sam's heart began to pound. As quick as a wink, Sam slipped his candy bar into the bag with the mittens, and he pressed the bag into the man's hands. Sam ran out the door shouting, Merry Christmas! His mom gave him a hug. I'm proud of you, she whispered. I know that wasn't easy, but you brought a little light into the world tonight. Sam asked his mom if they could drive by the park, and as he watched the flame on a big candle blink on and off, he thought about how it's not fair that some people don't have a home to live in or food to eat. Soon it was Christmas Eve, the most special night of the year. Sam and his family went to church for Christmas Eve service, and they sang songs, and they listened to the story. And then in the sanctuary, they lit candles. And it was so beautiful as they all looked around, and they shared their candle light. On Christmas morning, Sam ran downstairs as fast as he could. Under the tree was the train with the shiny red engine. And what was that? The sparkle box. Sam could hardly wait to open it. He sat on his mom's lap with Dad nearby, and Sam slowly lifted the lid of the box. Inside, there were just a few pieces of paper with words written on them. Puzzled, he took the papers out and he started to read the words out loud. Mittens and a candy bar given to someone in need. Warm blankets and food for the homeless. A well in Africa that will provide clean drinking. Sam's mom explained, Sam, the sparkle box is our gift to Jesus on Christmas Day, which is his birthday. <laughs> Sam was confused, but we didn't give Jesus a gift. We gave things to people who needed them. And his mom smiled, you're right, and no gift could make Jesus happier. He taught us whatever we do for people in need, we do for him. So every year we think of some special gifts that we can give to Jesus. We write those down, and we put them in the sparkle box. We'll open the box and read out loud the gifts that we gave in honor of his birthday. Sam thought about the man who was curled up on the park bench, and about the mittens and the blankets, and the well that would help bring clean water to a village in Africa. And he looked at his mom, and he smiled at her through tears, and he said, happy tears. So you know what we have here today? It's a sparkle box. 
Because even though it's not really Christmas, we're thinking about Christmas today, right? And Jesus' birthday. And so I thought maybe we would look inside and see what's in our Francis Asbury sparkle box. I'm going to need somebody who can help me read what these, what these say. Let's see what they say.
come now to the time in our worship where we join our prayers together. And know that God hears us as we pray together. Prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of intercession uh, for our church, for our neighbors, and our community. And we'll have a moment of silence for you to offer uh, your prayers to God, and then I'll offer a prayer for us together. Let us pray. O oh God of hope, we're so glad to be together this morning, here in your house, here in the presence of your spirit, here with members of the body of Christ. We come to worship and to praise you. We have brought you ourselves, all that we are, in body, in mind, in spirit. We ask that you fill us, renew us, and send us out to be messengers of your hope. Right now, the days are long and hot. It may not feel much like Christmas, but we are Christmas people. We are Easter people. We are spirit-filled people. And we are people of your word. We are people who need you and one another. Through what we do and say, let your light shine in us. May we reflect our faith, which says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, and his name is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Together, we offer our prayers of thanksgiving for your mercy and your grace, for your constant abiding presence, God with us always. Together, we offer our prayers of intercession, lifting up to you names and circumstances and seeking your comfort and care. For your children who suffer and struggle, who feel like they are at the end of their road. For your children who feel burdened with cares beyond their capabilities. For your children whose sadness or anger overflows today. For your children who lack the support they need for tomorrow. Lord, we pray. We ask for your peace and your understanding, your hope. And your care. Lord, send your disciples to be your hands and your feet and your heart in this world. As we worship and pray today, God, we ask your blessing upon these gifts that we have brought, packed into boxes of care and love and fun. As these red and green boxes go into the world, we hope that they will be expressions of care and love for every child into whose hands they are placed. We know that all children are your children. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ who came as a child and who is our greatest gift. And we pray together the prayer he has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we worship together today, one of our acts of worship, as we pray and as we sing and as we hear God's word, uh, we also give our gifts, our offerings, our tithes, we're turning to God a portion of what God has first gifted and trusted to us. Thank you for the ways that you give uh, so faithfully and so generously to support and sustain ministries of our church that don't just stay here, but they flow beyond us into our community and even out into the world. We'll give our gifts today by passing the offering plates up and down our pews. Uh, we always can uh, give our gifts uh, into the boxes in the narthex and online through our church website. We'll invite the ushers to come forward. Thank you.
upon these gifts and those who have offered them. Send them into the world to bring about faith, hope, and love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Saved was at last abandoned. 
Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not set sail from Crete, and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage, and there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor, and indeed God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we will have to run aground on some island. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise One of history's greatest artists is Italy's Michelangelo. Every year, five million tourists flock to Vatican City to see the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, which he famously painted. Michelangelo, however, always thought of himself more as a sculptor rather than a painter. In fact, when he signed the receipt for payment for painting the Sistine Chapel, he signed it. Michelangelo Buonarroti, comma, sculptor. He once said that every block of stone has a statue inside of it, and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. With that attitude, he brought to life the David and the Pieta. And together with those two, his most famous sculptures include this one called Kneeling Angel. Michelangelo carved it in 1495 when he was just 20 years old. He said, I saw the angel in the block of marble and I carved until I set him free. For Michelangelo, the, the idea, the being, it was already there. He simply had to use his hands and his eyes and his chisel and his skill to release it. And let it be what it was always meant to be. Angels have long been a popular subject for artists. And angels fascinate us. They're everywhere. We go to the store, we find collectible angels lining the shelves. Angel characters appear in books and television and movies. Do you know angels even play baseball in Los Angeles? <laughs> At Christmas time, we include them in our nativity sets. We place them at the top of our Christmas trees. We include them in our Christmas pageants as disciples of all ages. Tell us again the story of that child that has been born for us. Surveys say that 77% of Americans believe in angels, including 40% of non-religious people. Which is really interesting. Some people who are not sure they believe in God say that they believe in angels. Another survey said that on the list of most popular tattoos, angels rank in at number three. While we believe in angels as, as spiritual and divine beings, we sometimes also describe our fellow humans as angels. We call first responders volunteers, caregivers, and rescuers angels, especially when they've done something extraordinary in the life of another person. Many of us have stories of someone whose presence or whose help or care made a great difference in our life. I heard someone use that word just this week, describing a friend who was offering help and support in a time of need. In the scriptures, the word angel means messenger. Angels are divine beings, and it's their primary job to share messages on behalf of God. And they fill other roles, too, like, like ministering to people or supporting them, protecting people in God's name. And interestingly, in scripture, angels are not described as having wings. It seems that they can appear almost human-like. Hebrews 13, 2 tells us 
Do not be afraid to entertain strangers, for by doing so, people have entertained angels without knowing it. Last month, as we went through the book of Genesis and we heard some of Abraham's story, we heard about several angelic appearances. When she was cast out from camp into the wilderness, it was an angel who appeared to Hagar. When he had taken his son Isaac to the top of a mountain and was prepared to offer him back to God, an angel appeared to Abraham and showed him a ram caught in a thicket who would substitute as an offering. In the New Testament, we find that angels strengthened Jesus in his most desperate moments. They appeared to Paul uh, many times, once releasing him from prison. Angels uh, announced the births of Jesus and John. And they were present at the tomb of Jesus and announced the resurrection. Angels encourage and rescue and they inspire hope. And it is an angel who saves the day uh, in our film for today, though he may not look or act like angels that we might have imagined. It's a Wonderful Life is a Christmas favorite of many people. It's been more than 75 years since that movie was released, and it's still on the list of the 100 best American films ever made. When I asked of the congregation to vote on the movies that we would include in our sermon series, the contest for the Christmas movie was not a close one. <laughs> it's a Wonderful Life was ahead by a mile. The movie begins with these celestial beings having a, a conversation somewhere in the heavens about a human being named George Bailey. <laughs> and one of these beings, an angel, is going to be sent to earth to help George. But before he can help, he needs to learn about George. So he watches George's life unfold, almost like he's the one watching a movie. And so along with the angel, we, the audience, uh, we watch scenes from George's childhood. We watch him save his younger brother, uh, Harry, from drowning when they're sledding at wintertime, and he crashes into some broken uh, ice in the lake. After he rescues his brother, George comes down with a terrible cold that causes him to lose the hearing in his left ear. As a youth, we see George working um, as an assistant in the local pharmacy. And one day, he prevents the pharmacist from accidentally poisoning uh, a customer's prescription. George Bailey lives in the lovely town of Bedford Falls, New York. But he's always dreamed of seeing the world. He has this big trip planned when he, um, before he goes off to college, but he has to cancel it because his father dies suddenly. And George steps into the family business to keep it going, the Bedford Falls building and loan. That's a job he never wanted. He hopes that eventually his younger brother will finish school and come back home and he'll take over the family business and George will be free to, to go abroad and to follow his dreams. Uh, but here he gets married, and he gets another job offer. And George releases him to take that opportunity, and, and George stays home, and he runs the business out of obligation to his family and to the community that that business serves. Eventually, after these scenes unfold, we come back to this Christmas Eve when crisis strikes George. George's uncle works for the same company, the building and loan, and he's gone to the bank to make their deposit, and he takes $8,000 in cash in an envelope. And being a little bit of a scatterbrain, he misplaces that money. He retraces his steps, and he looks everywhere, and he panics when he cannot find that envelope filled with cash. And it turns out that the bank owner, the, the wealthiest man in town, and their family's sort of enemy, has found that envelope, and he keeps it, and he doesn't say anything about it. He sees an opportunity to squash that family and their business and lift up his own interests. And George is distraught. That money is missing and unaccounted for. He cannot replace it. $8,000 would be the equivalent of more than 100000 today. 
this will ruin him. It'll be the end of his reputation and his business. He'll certainly go to prison. What will happen to his family? George doesn't know what to do. And he prays. I'm at the end of my rope. Show me the way, God. This is a desperate place. It's a desperate feeling. George goes to the edge of a bridge and he's prepared to end his life. It's a serious and desperate moment in the movie. And maybe it's one that hits home when people are watching the film. There are seasons when we find ourselves in despair or severe depression or one of our loved ones dies. There are seasons where we need to lean on other people when we need resources to help us and to lift us up. And no matter what happens in these seasons, we are never outside of God's mercy. Ever. As George stands on that bridge, before his feet can leave the ground, someone steps in. It's Clarence Oddbody, AS2. That stands for Angel Second Class. <laughs> He's one of the divine beings that we saw uh, in the first scene. And he's an angel who really wants to earn his wings. He hopes that if he can really help George Bailey, then he'll finally be granted his angel wings. And so in trying to help and make connections for George to, to build a bridge and restore peace and relay to him this divine message, Clarence first redirects George. And he listens to George. And then he takes George on a really unexpected journey. When George says, it would be better if I had never been born, Clarence makes it happen. He shows George what the world and what his community would look like if that was really the case. And it turns out it would look very, very different. The entire town looks different. It has a different name. It has different businesses. It's, it's run by that uh, evil banker who had kind of taken the money. George wasn't there to stand up to him or to offer altern alternative funding to support the middle and lower class workers in his town. George's brother, Harry, had drowned when he was nine years old. George wasn't there to save him. His wife never married. His children were never born. The building and loan had closed decades before and it never served all those clients, helping them to own their own homes and to begin to break the cycles of systemic poverty. Clarence helps George look back at his life and see it through a different lens. Our scripture reading today is a secondhand report of Paul's experience with an angel, with a divine messenger. The book of Acts was written by Luke, the same Luke who wrote the gospel. This is volume two of his good news, his witness. And Luke had traveled some with Paul. He was a physician and had come with Paul on some of his journeys. And by the time we get to chapter 27 in Acts, Paul is, is nearing the end of his life. We've heard reports about his conversion and about his missionary journeys. He's taken three of them. They've all involved danger and conflict, life-changing moments, and now Paul is taking his final journey. He's headed to Rome. And Paul's actually a prisoner on this ship. He's been arrested and detained for his preaching, and he's being transported to Rome along with many other prisoners. And they set out on a ship that was heading east, and it was going to stop at a number of ports along the coast. And as they started, Paul warned them, this is going to be dangerous. We might have some losses on this trip. But the crew presses on anyways. And somewhere past the island of Crete, they, they encounter this terrible storm. Maybe a hurricane? Luke calls it a, a nor'easter. The storm was so strong they lost control of their ship. <laughs> and afraid that they would just be pushed ashore until they crashed, they lowered the anchor. They started throwing their cargo overboard. They threw the ship's tackle overboard on the third day. And day after day, they waited 
and the storm continued. They looked up and they couldn't see the sun or the stars. They had no navigational guides. They were stuck. And their hope began to disintegrate. Perhaps that's how George Bailey felt. Like his hope had disintegrated and like he couldn't see a way forward. There was nothing left to guide him and, and he couldn't see a way out. It was like a tunnel of darkness. When that happens, we need someone who can show us the way to ignite a spark of hope, help us find another perspective when we can't see it. At one point, Paul stands up on the ship and he addresses the entire group. And at first, it's a little bit of a I told you so speech. Hey guys, remember how I warned you that this might happen and we shouldn't set out? Anyway, now that we're here, Keep up your courage. You will not die, he tells them. And we might lose the ship, but we're not going to lose any one of us. Last night I had a vision, and an angel of God was there. And the angel spoke to me and told me not to be afraid. He said, I'm going to make it to Rome, and I'll be there standing before the emperor. Friends, God will be faithful. God will get us there safely. So don't you be afraid either. Keep up the faith. It was two weeks more of the storm before Paul and his comrades at sea had any resolution. You can see their journey here and the little squiggle that marks the storm on their journey. At some point, Paul convinced them that they needed to eat. They hadn't been eating either because they were too seasick or because they had chosen to fast. But Paul encourages them, and he, and he takes bread, and he gives thanks to God, and he breaks the bread, and he gives it to them to eat. That, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? And then they took the rest of their wheat, and they throw it overboard to lighten their load even more. And the next day, they steered what was left of their ship onto the coast of Malta, and their feet touched the land again. It was just as the angel had said. Paul trusted the one that he knew was a messenger of God. He trusted that message of hope. And he used his voice. He used his faith to help the people around him. There were more than 200 other people on that ship. And he helped them trust that message also. At the end of the movie, George also finds his way out of despair. He decides that he does want to live. He wants to go back home to his family and his friends and his community. And there's a scene where he runs down the streets of his town and he suddenly sees it differently. And he looks at people around him and he wishes them Merry Christmas. And he comes back home and he, after he hugs and kisses his children, he's prepared for that arrest warrant to be served. And before that can happen, these people start showing up at his house. His wife had taken the initiative to ask for help for George. At the beginning of the movie, we've already heard them praying for George on his behalf. They've been asking God to help him. And now we see them showing up with their physical resources. Person after person comes in and offers their financial gifts. They raise more than $8,000 and they cover that loss. They save George's business. And packed into that living room all together, the people of Bedford Falls start singing a Christmas carol, a Charles Wesley Christmas carol, the very one that we sang together at the start of our worship this morning, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And as they sing, George finds a gift from Clarence that he had left. It's a note. He says to George, remember, no man is a failure who has friends. Thanks for the wings. Love, Clarence. It wasn't just Clarence who helped that night. As they sing together, George looks around his home that is filled with people, and all of those people were his angels. His spouse, his children, his brother, his friends, his co-workers, his, his customers, his neighbors, all there to support him, to encourage him, to say, Thank you. 
when his brother uh, toasts George and he says, to my older brother, the richest man in town, I don't think he's talking about the cash that's laying on the table. George is rich in other ways. <laughs> he has experienced love and friendship and mercy. <laughs> so have we. As members of the body of Christ, as people of faith, we know God has rescued us. <laughs> In the person of Jesus, God made this connection between uh, God and humankind, and it can never be broken. <laughs> In Jesus, God offers us that love and mercy. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. <laughs> As the hymn says, God and sinners reconciled. Jesus restores what had been broken. And he shows us what a God they love really is. And we are asked then to be reflections and messengers of that faith and that hope. John Wesley once said about angels that we may imitate them in all holiness suiting our lives to the prayer our Lord himself taught us, laboring to do his will on earth as angels do it in heaven. We're invited to imitate them. You know, Paul was that sort of person over and over again in his life. Even when his crew is shipwrecked, even when they're in danger, even when they have command and power over him, they listen to him. Paul will get to Rome. He'll stay there for two years under house arrest, and people will show up at his door constantly to hear him, to learn from him. Paul will welcome them, and he will teach them everything he knows about Jesus. Tradition says he died there in Rome, probably at the order of the emperor. And today, half of our New Testament stems from Paul, and from his life, and from all the people that he affected. We are invited to imitate. In South Georgia, there's a United Methodist Church called Brooklyn UMC. And there's a group in that church that's called the Pillowcase Angels. In 2015, there was a group of women from the church that went to the local uh, children's home. And they were taking items they collected, toiletries and, and other supplies for the kids. And as they toured around the grounds with the director, they noticed that each child had on their bed homemade blankets and quilts. But the pillowcase uh, kind of stood out. It, it wasn't colorful or different or unique. And they decided that's something our church can do. We can fill a void. They started out sewing pillowcases. And they started out with their own supplies. But as people heard about what they were doing, they started donating material and thread and sewing equipment. They started uh, creating beautiful, colorful, individual pillowcases that were given to children in the foster care system in the state of Georgia. And to date, they've made over 900 pillowcases. And the kids get to take those pillowcases with them wherever they go. And some of them have sent the women letters. They've drawn pictures of their pillowcases, and they've sent thank you cards and notes. And so the foster care agencies in Georgia started to call them the pillowcase Part of the body of Christ, we are invited, we are asked to listen to, to care for others, to be messengers of love and grace to people who might be struggling. I don't know about the bells or the wings, but I know you might be a messenger. You might be someone who announces good news of great joy. You might be asked to stand beside someone when they feel like they are at the end of their rope and they can't see a way out of darkness. You might be asked to offer hope and connection, to say, as the angel host once did, to you, a child is born, a Savior who is the Messiah of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest heaven.
grace and the peace of the one who has called and claimed you. Go forth to be messengers of hope. And Merry Christmas.